在 Web Security， 也就是 Web 安全的领域中，那依照目标的不同，可以分为 Server Side 的漏洞以及 Client Side 的漏洞。那而在 Client Side Security 中，只要你没有听过这个讲者的名字，你说出来一定会被笑。所以，让我们欢迎世界知名，也也是长长期占据 Twitter 漏洞排行榜第一名的 File Descriptor 大大。那让我们掌声欢迎。Testing.、Uh, good afternoon,、uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm speaking in English, even though I can speak in Mandarin. But、um, anyway, I hope you can understand、um, what I'm saying because I I, th I think the translation is a little bit delayed. So anyway,、uh, the topic of my talk is the the Cookie Monster in your browsers.、Uh, it's supposed to be your browsers, but、uh, the Cookie Monster is blocking the the Y letters. But anyway. So the reason why I want to talk about cookies, even though it's、uh, such a basic topic, is because people always think they understand what cookie does, but they actually don't.、Uh, because you see, cookie is a very simple concept. Like people、uh, work with cookies like every day. Like your session cookies, like everything is cookies. But they just think it's it's a magic it's a magic thing. It's just like it works. For whatever reason, but they never understood why Koki or how it works.、Um, a little bit about myself. I'm from Hong Kong, as as, as you can tell, I guess. I'm a pen tester for Q53, and、uh, this is、um, a very good company because we have obviously a lot of good members in a company.、Uh, one is Yan Hong.、Uh, he's the author of the Meltdown and the Spectre. Um, this, the Intel CPU bug. He was the ex、uh, members of our company, and the other one is Life Overflow. He's a fam famous YouTuber. He's also our member. So this is a very good company. But I'm the last famous in my company, and I love web application security and browser security. So I do a lot of research in、um, browser security, and also I do a lot of、uh, research on. Uh, web application security, but mostly just client side because not a lot of people are doing client side security.、Um, I think my talk is the only talk that is、uh, focusing on client side security for Hitcon. So I hope you won't get bored because、uh, I think my talk is probably the most boring talk in the whole Hitcon conference. And、um, as Orange said, I'm the number one hacker on Twitter's bug bounty program, but it's just luck, I guess. Um, so motivation. Why I want to really talk about Koki is because if you、uh, if you are a bug bounty hunter or if you are just、um, a, a hobbyist in bug bounty hunting, you'll often see something called outer scope. That means if you find a bug on、um, one of the access on the outer scope domain, you, your bug will not be recognized, and so you will not get money.、Um, it's basically a waste of time. So. For for example, in the access dot Spotify dot com, even though if you can find any bugs in this domain, it will not be counted because、um, for whatever reason.、Uh, one of the reasons is probably because it's、uh, managed by a third party company, like for example, like uh, help uh, dot something something dot com. It's usually like、uh, Zendesk or like other third party companies. So if There is like a vulnerability in、uh, these kind of domains that is not really the company's resp responsibility because it's a third party, and sometimes、uh, this, it's a little bit ridiculous, like Pornhub, right?、Um, if you can find any bugs in any subdomain on Pornhub.com,、uh, it is not a valid vulnerability according to the policy for whatever reason, and this is not very fair. Um, actually, there is there was a case、uh, on Hack One,、um, one Uber program. Somebody found an XSS on、um, some random subdomain dot uber dot com, and not only was his bug not getting recognized, but his report was actually、uh, being closed as、uh, spam. That means、uh, the developers think that、uh, the reporter is not knowing what he's doing. And it's kind of a drama because、uh, the reporter was banned from the Uber program, and actually, I believed he was banned from Hack One. And I think it's actually not very fair because even though the cross-site scripting in the subdomain of the Uber.com is out of scope, but if you can,、uh, if you can know how to exploit,、uh, how, like how to escalate the、uh, impact, it's actually very critical. And that's what I'm going to talk、uh, about in this talk. 
Um, so this is Cookie Monster. It was actually, um, his first appearance was in 1966, but it's not really relevant to our talk, but um, it's a little bit trivia. Um, so Cookies has been um, a very messy thing. There, was, there were like three uh, main uh, specifications in the past. The first one is the Netscape cookies aspect. That was the, the one that is used in most browsers. Uh, it defines the basic syntax. It's like uh, the name and equal value and uh, some little attributes like uh, domain, path, that kind of stuff. And it basically defines the basic mechanism like how browsers should store the cookies, how servers should handle these cookies. And then uh, in 1997, we have the first R RFC because uh, obviously every browser, every browser at that time was using Koki, but there was no standardized uh, specification. So we had the first R RFC. It adds a, uh, a, l a lot of more attributes like uh, the version, the port number, um, a lot of stuff that we, ha we don't see uh, uh, in this day. And it also, focus, it also emphasizes on privacy control. So it basically tells the browser should provide an option uh, f uh, for users to disable cookies for uh, like third party websites or whatever rules they want to um, define. And then we have a newer RFC on 2000. Um, it basically obsoletes the uh, previous RFC because um, because the previous RFC was actually not used by any of the browser, so they want to uh, really they re they really want people to use uh, the uh, the new RFC. So they basically set a new header called set Koki two, and it was ever only implemented by Opera, but not other browsers and Koki two. So what they're doing is um, because everybody is still using the uh, 1994 specification, and they want to actually separate uh, from the, uh, because everybody was using the old Koki header, but they're not uh, following the 1997 specification. So they want to make a set Koki 2 so that uh, people have to use, uh, have to follow the newest specification uh, versus the old uh, set, the normal set Koki. But these specifications are never followed by any of the browsers. So it's actually useless. Um, this is what we are seeing uh, for uh, not, like nowadays. The RFC uh, 26265 uh, is the latest and the most up-to-date RFC of cookies. It, obsol it obsolates every of the previous RFC and um, it has a little bit difference than the previous RFCs because uh, the previous RFCs are defining the, the specification, like defining how browsers, how a server should handle this, the cookies, but uh, this RFC is uh, very a little bit different because it actually summarizes the behavior of every modern browser. So instead of limiting what they should do, it's actually uh, like summarizing uh, what they are actually doing, and it also adds a very very important flag called the HTTP only. Uh, even though this flag was actually added in 2002 by Internet Explorer, but uh, it was only after 2011 it was officially added into the specification. And then we have uh, three newer specifications called uh, Koki prefixes. It improves um, the integrity of the Koki's uh, cross subdomains, uh, which I will talk about uh, like in this talk. And we also have the same side cookies. It was, um, it's, it's supposed to be uh, the, uh, the cure for CSRF. And we will talk about that in the very end of the slide. And we also have the strict security cookies, which is also trying to fix a problem in the uh, RFC because the RFC only uh, specifies that uh, a security cookies can only be transmitted in HTTP requests, but it doesn't, uh, restrict the, the ability for browser to override and secure cookies in an in, in HTTP context. And it's not very re relevant to our talk, but you know, just a little bit of information. And if you can notice, uh, these specifications are under RFC 26265 bis. So it's a little bit different. It's basically an improvement of the previous specification, but they don't have uh, a lot of new stuff to add, so they rather Add a BIS in, instead of creating a whole RFC. So, 
Um, here's uh, here's some oranges for orange. Hey, orange, this is for you. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> this is some cookies. Um, and these cookies are very has a special meaning because uh, here we have 101 cookies. So we are talking about cookie 101. Um, this is some basic uh, like how cookies works in browsers. And so in order to set a cookie, you first send an HTTP request and the server will respond a response with a set cookie header. So in this case, we uh, the server is trying to set a cookie called SID123 uh, with a path, uh, an attribute path called uh, slash to admin. And there is another way to set a cookie is uh, via the JavaScript API. It's like you do document cookie and then equals uh, something. Just it's just like set cookie, but instead of uh, doing it in the server side, you're doing it on the client side. And to um, for the browser to send a cookie to the server, uh, every sub uh, every subsequent HTTP request will have uh, the cookie attached in the cookie header. So it's like uh, the SID one two three, um, but you'll notice it doesn't contain the attributes like the path or other information is because whatever reason. It was actually in the previous uh, RFC, like the 2109, um, the kind of specification, it, it actually also sends the attribute to the server, but nobody ever implemented that. I guess it's probably redundant, but I, I will talk about that uh, because this is actually very critical. The, the lack of attributes sent to the server is actually a very important issue because you'll see. Uh, so this is the basic syntax of a set cookie um, header. So as, as I said, you have the name and equals an attribute, uh, sorry, a value, and then you have uh, an attribute. You can have you can have a zero attribute or you can have uh, multiple attributes, and you also you can also have a flag. A flag is also a kind of attribute, but uh, it doesn't have an attribute value. So instead of like path equals something, and like secure doesn't have like equals something because it's just a flag. It's either it, it exists or not. So we have um, a lot of uh, actually not a lot, but some attributes you get that you can set. The first two are expires and max age. These two attributes define the lifespan of a cookie, like how long it should expire. And then we have domain, uh, we'll talk about that later, and path, and same side, it's uh, irrelevant. And the two flags are secure and HTTP only. But in this talk, we'll only focus on the domain and the path attributes, and the HTTP only attributes, because uh, other attributes are just not as interesting as, as these ones. Um, so domain attributes. Um, so what the domain attribute is doing is to let a domain to set a cookies for its subdomains. So in this case, we have example.com setting a domain, uh, setting a cookie like foo equal equals bar uh, to all of its subdomains. So like subdomain sub uh, dot example dot com and sub of dot of dot sub dot example dot com can also uh, access these cookies. So if you uh, have uh, this cookies and if you are navigating to like a subdomain like sub dot example dot com then your cookies will, will also be sent to these subdomains. And you can also set a cookies for other subdomains. Like in this example, we have we are on sub.example.com. We can set um, the, the the cookies and define the, the domain attribute to be dot example.com. It's, it's just it's actually just the same as the previous slide, but anyway. So not only can example.com see these cookies, but also sub uh, any subdomain, any hierarchy uh, subdomain of example.com can see this cookie. And if you do not set the domain attribute, then uh, only the current domain that sets the cookie can see the cookie. Uh, the cookie. Like in this example, only sub.example.com can, uh, can see this cookie. Um, example.com and subdomain of sub.example.com cannot see uh, this cookie. Um, very, it makes sense. Um, so I want to do a little bit of uh, poll. So, uh, what do you think this cookie is scoped to? Uh, the domain is example.com, but notice uh, in the previous example we had the domain attribute is uh, set to dot example.com. That means it signifies its uh, setting to the subdomains, 
and in this example, we we don't have the dot um, in front. So it um, so what so if you think it only says cookie for example.com, then uh, raise up your hands. Anyone? Okay, uh, a few. Um, what uh, if you think it only sets cookie for any subdomain, but not the domain uh, example.com? Then raise up your hand. Um, no hands. Okay. What uh, both? All right. A lot of you are kind of smart. I mean, smarter than the average people, because so I so basically I did the exact poll in Twitter. And more than half of the people answered in, incorrectly. The, the, the correct answer is both. Um, even though, uh, so intuitively, it looks like it should only be visible to example.com because it's what it says. But uh, in reality, it actually sets Koki for uh, both, like not only the current domain, but also the subdomains. And um, this is uh, a random person. A uh, friend of mine, I guess. Uh, for his, for privacy reason, I've blacked out his name and um, and his uh, uh, profile picture, I guess. So, uh, uh, an average people would think that uh, if you set a domain to, like, example.com, then the cookie should be only accessible to example.com, but not its subdomain, um, which is which is what I thought, but um, it's not. So basically, the ORFC. Uh, is doing the exact opposite of the current RFC is doing. Uh, in the old RFC, in the old RFC, you have to set, uh, you have to do the uh, the leading dots like dot example dot com, and the new RFC is doing the exact opposite. It is basically saying you cannot add a dot in the um, like dot example dot com. You have to do example dot com. I don't know why, but it's very confusing. So basically, dot or no dot, it doesn't make a difference. It it both set a cookie that it's accessible to uh, both the subdomains and domain, and to basically both widen the scope of a cookie to all the subdomains. And this is a problem um, because some websites will uh, mistakenly add the domain attribute, thinking it's basically the same as not setting the domain attribute. But imagine if you have a subdomain that is like a third party or like it's it is vulnerable. If it's compromised, then if your your cookie on the main site that is not supposed to send to like uh, other subdomains has this attribute, then it will be leaked to uh, unauthorized parties. Like for example, if you have like uh, like Zendesk dot example dot com, and then if they are vulnerable to either like cross site scripting or uh, like remote code execution, then. Um, they can access your cookie in the main domain, even though you're not supposed to let them know. So uh, I've seen a lot of, uh, not a lot, but some cases of these uh, when I'm doing pen tests, because you want to limit uh, the, the scope of your of your cookies uh, to be as um, narrow as possible. So something to keep in mind. And if you are reading, if you read the RFC, uh, it says something interesting. Uh, it, ha it basically says some existing user agents, a user agent is, uh, ref is referring to browsers, treats an absence domain attribute as if the domain attribute were present. So that means uh, for some browsers, even though if you do not uh, set the domain attribute, it's treating it as you're setting a domain attribute. So it's very, very dangerous because uh, as I said, if, you, if your cookie is not uh, supposed to let other subdomain to access, then um, it's kind of dangerous. And I'm talking about Internet Explorer, of course. Um, uh, actually, Internet Explorer has a, a page that is dedicated to all the weird behavior of cookies uh, only in Internet Explorer. And one of them is if you don't specify a domain attribute, it will still send uh, all your cookies on main domain to uh, all the subdomains. So it's kind of um, a bad thing. Uh, luckily, they fixed the problem on Windows 10, but they forgot that people are still using Windows 7 or Windows 8.1. So um, uh, I think in next year, Windows 7 will be end of life, but still for 8.1, I think it's still a long way to go. So something to keep in mind. I mean, you can't really fix it because it's Microsoft's problem, but you know, good to know.
Okay, um, uh, I'm about to talk. I'm, I'm about to talk uh, something that you can use in um, your like pen test or bug hunting. That's more practical. So cokey bomb is used in military. I think I don't know, but it's it's not what I want to say. I want to say cokey bomb uh, in the context of client side. So. Most servers have a length limitation on request headers. That means if you if your request uh, is uh, if if the request headers of your uh, of your request is too long, then most uh, most server side will reject your request because they don't want to they don't want you to cause a denial of service of of their service because like for example if you inject like a hundred of Headers that is like very long. Then they need to pro they need to parse these headers, and if you don't have a limitation, then you can easily cause denial of service of the website. So they usually have a limit, and when this limit is exceeded, it will return either HTTP four and three or four three one. One is the uh, entity too long. The other one is header too long. I, I think. So what you can uh, abuse this behavior is if say if you have a limited cookie injection like. You have a cookie injection that you cannot control the name, but you can control the value. Then you can inject uh, a lot of like very long cookie. Then uh, any victim that vi that visits this uh, web page will have a very long cookie set in the browser, and then all subsequent requests to the server will not load because the server rejects the request. And for an average user, because they don't know what's going on. They will not know how to uh, handle this issue because you have to manually uh, clear the cookie in your browser. So it's um, some problem, and you can additionally add the domain and the expired attributes to um, increase the impact of this issue. Like if you can set the domain attribute to every subdomain of the of the vulnerable page, and you can also set the expired attribute to a very very long time, so people will. Persistently affected by this um, um, DOS. And this is an example uh, that I that, that I reported to Twitter. They have a cookie bomb issue. Basically, co uh, Twitter was vulnerable uh, because they have uh, they had a little snippet on the homepage. Um, yep, I think you can see it. So basically, if you are navigating to Twitter in a some random domain, then they will set a cookie for uh, to to record your referral value. So, like, uh, if you like, say you come from example.com and you navigate to Twitter, then they will set a cookie, uh, the ev underscore redirect and underscore uh, a name that you can control via the uh, the hash value, the uh, the URL hash value uh, for for your browser. Um, so, what you can do is. Say you have, uh, you make the, the victim to visit uh, the example.com, AAA, a lot of A's, and then you make them navigate to twitter.com, like slash A, that sets the EV uh, redirect A, and then do, and you do the same for like B and C, so you have a lot of cookies that exceeds like uh, eight kilobytes. Then um, you, the victim will no longer be able to access Twitter because his browser is polluted, because the, and every request uh, will have this very long uh, cookies value to the uh, Twitter server. Then they cannot use Twitter anymore unless they clear the cookies, which I doubt they will do because they will put the blame on Twitter, I guess. And it's actually a design issue. For all the shared subdomain service, you can imagine like uh, GitHub pages because they sh all share dot GitHub dot IO. So say if you have your username dot GitHub dot IO, then you theoretically you can set an HTML, then you run a JavaScript that uh, sets a lot of uh, useless cookies to all the subdomains of GitHub dot IO. Then everybody can. Uh, ev Every subdomain on GitHub.io will, will not be accessible. Supposedly, uh, kind of, it, it sounds very promising, right? Uh, I mean, there are also other services like BlogPost.com or or Amazon. Like a lot of like uh, services are using these patterns. So it looks like you can perform cookie bombs in these services, but you cannot. 
unfortunately, uh, because uh, there is something called the public suffix list. It's curated by community. Uh, the community uh, consists of all the browser vendors like Chrome, uh, Firefox, and I think it's for Microsoft. So basically, uh, it defines uh, a list of domains that cannot uh, contain cookies for its subdomain. So, ba so if, for example, if you uh, check the public service list, you will see github.io is on the list. That means any subdomain .github.io will cannot set cookies for uh, github.io because uh, because you know uh, GitHub pages are mostly static pages. They don't need cookies. Um, at all, so it makes sense that uh, you limit the ability for them to set cookies, and it it's also the same list that restricts uh, the the ability to set cookies on the TLD, like for example .com .tw, because it looks like it's a domain uh, like .com .tw, and if without this list, you have no way to tell whether this is a TLD or not, like because uh, there are also a, a lot of weird um, uh, like TLD, like the Chinese domains, like or even Japanese domains, that you, you you really have no way to tell if they are an actual TLD. So you need this list to tell the browser that uh, you you don't allow cookies to be sent on these domains. So um, it mitigates the problem. Um, but I mean, you can still use cookie bombs if you have like a uh, limited uh, cookie injection. Like if you have a useless XSS on a subdomain, then you can set cookies for all the uh, set a, uh, perform the cookie bomb attack for all the subdomains of the service. Then at least you can uh, perform a client side denial of service rather than nothing, I guess. Because normally, if you have not an XSS on a useless subdomain, then it's useless. You have you have no you have nothing to report. But at least you have something to report now with cookie bombs. And the other thing, the other thing you can do with Cookie Bomb is uh, with the app cache. Uh, this is uh, my previous talk uh, on the uh, on on the app cache poisoning. It's it's basically like because app app cache can fall back to uh, to a cached response. So you could do Cookie Bomb and then force the app cache to fall back to your um, uh, to your specific files. Like for example, if you are on Dropbox.com, because Dropbox allows you to uh, set HTML on the domain, so you could use app cache, and then you can um, specify the fallback to your file. Then you perform cookie bombs to all the um, every access on Dropbox.com. Then, uh, then the victim will always go to your access, even though they are going to like the files because you polluted uh, the. The fallback uh, value, and then you, you create you use the cookie bomb to make to make them um, to make the Dropbox.com inaccessible, so they have to fall back to your app sets. Um, you can check out uh, this technique in uh, in my talk. I've put the slides on the internet, and may, and this is uh, there is actually one more thing you can do with cookie bomb, and this is very useful, I think. So, say you have a boring XSS, and the site is using OAuth. Like uh, login with Google, and it looks like you can use XSS to capture the award uh, code and then take over the account. But um, so, like example, if you if the website is using Google.com award to log in, and then it will do a redirect um, to example.com with the authorization code. And if you can steal the code, then you can log in as, as the victim. And then, um, it, and the website usually will do another redirect to the home page because uh, it's, there's really nothing to show on the callback uh, endpoint. And it looks like it can be achieved uh, with XSS, but you can you, you actually cannot do it with just XSS because first the first thing is the authorization code can only be used once. So that means uh, when the redirect hits example.com, then the code is already used. At, after that point, even though if you can steal this code, it's useless because you cannot reuse this code anymore. And the second hurdle is uh, the intermediate HTTP redirect is transparent. That means, like, because it's doing two redirects, 
the middle re redirect is transparent. You cannot tell if they are doing multiple redirects. So that means you cannot actually get the location of the middle redirect. So there are two hurdles you need to overcome. And CookieBomb is the exact um, solution to these challenges. So what you can do is you can first perform a CookieBomb attack via your XSS. And then you can embed an iframe pointing to the OAuth uh, identity provider. That means Google.com. And then it, it redirects the target with the authorization code. That means like um, the, the, the step. And then the server will reject the request because the header is too large. That means they do not process the authorization code. That means you successfully handle the first issue that the authorization code can only be used once. And then you can use cross-site scripting to get the authorization code from the iframe URL. And this is probably a little bit difficult to understand, but it's just, um, here's, here's some vi visualization. So you have example.com. Let's say example.com is vulnerable to cross-site scripting. You, and you set a cookie bomb, and then you use iframe to point to google.com uh, slash OAuth. And then when it finishes the redirect, uh, it's hitting uh, the server, but the server is rejecting this request because the, requ the request is sending a, a, a cookie value that is very large. And then you can use, uh, because it's already in example.com, that means they are same origin. Because they are same origin, you can get the URL. And because the URL contains the uh, authorization code, then you successfully uh, retrieve their authorization code. Then you can do account takeover at, at this point. So this is how you can escalate uh, a boring XSS to an account takeover. And this is an example. So if somebody uh, has collaborated with me on a, bug on a bug bounty report, and initially the XSS was only worth $500. Uh, we split the bounty, so it's uh, 250 plus 250. And after we escalated uh, the XSS to an account takeover, the ATO is account takeover, then the bounty uh, automatically increased to 5,000. So we basically made 10 times the original amount. So it kind of demonstrates uh, how you can use this technique to escalate your boring XSS. Uh, right. Okay, so that is uh, cookie bomb. Um, then we'll talk about path and HTTP only. Uh, so this request looks a bit suspicious because it has two cookie of the same name. So uh, raise up your hands if you think this is not a valid request. No? Okay, so, uh, so I assume all of you uh, think this is a valid request. So what do you think, like how many uh, Koki, like because you, we have two Kokis with the same name, but how, like how many do you think is possible? And I can tell you is the, the possibility is infinite. You can set not only two, not only three, but five or even more cookies with the same name. So this is an example I did with the zero day dot hitcon dot org. So uh, as you can see, I'm setting five cookies uh, with the same name, the XSRF uh, uh, token. They are all different values, but they are the same name. And this is how I set them. And so this is a little bit of misconception that nobody really knows. Koki, the key of, of Koki actually consists of a tuple called name, domain, and path. So that means if either one of, of these attributes is different, then it's a brand new Koki, even though they have the same name. So, and each of, if each of Koki has their own attribute list. So if you have a Koki uh, like, like um, XSR of token with the HTTP only tag, uh, only HTTP flag, then you can set another XSR token without the HTTP only flag, uh, but with a different domain, different path. So you basically uh, can set uh, like a, lo a lot of cookies with the same name, but uh, different value. Because uh, as I said, the attributes of a cookie are not sent to the server. So the server has no way to tell if these cookies are from which or a domain. And this is a big problem. Um, so basically, subdomains can force a cookie with the same name to the uh, main domain or, uh, or subdomains. And so this is uh, actually exploited by 
um, a Russian guy called Homakov. He's uh, he was very well known, and he basically exploited this bug on GitHub.com because uh, I think five years ago, uh, GitHub pages were hosted on GitHub.com instead of GitHub.io. So that means they're sharing the main domain, and you can host user-controlled content on any subdomain GitHub.com. And this is not a very good thing because you are, uh, because as I said, you can control the domain attribute, so you can pollute uh, every code on the main domain. So what Homokov did was he basically um, said he, he basically had his own GitHub page on like homokov.github.com, and then he set a CSRF cookie. Uh, with the domain github.com. That means the github.com will see his CSRF uh, cookie instead of the original one. Then because he can set the CSRF uh, uh, token value so that he, that he can control the, the CSRF token of a victim. So that means he can perform CSRF attack on github.com. So um, this is a very, very useful attack. And actually I have exploited the very same bug to Twitter because Twitter was also kind of vulnerable to, to this attack. I mean, actually, all services are vulnerable to this attack because it's kind of a design issue. It's not something that you can easily fix. Um, I have uploaded a slide with this um, like a few weeks ago, but I, uh, I think I regretted that decision because uh, I sent these slides to somebody to review, and they said they already know the trick because I re I already released this uh, these slides. So, but anyway, so this is the scenario. Um, so I had a cross site scripting on Tom .twitter .com. It's uh, this domain stores uh, the the access of your direct messages. So if you have uh, if you upload an image to uh, in a direct message on Twitter, then uh, the image will be uploaded to Tom twitter.com and this is a static domain because uh, all the access are static and twitter.com uses uh, two sets of cookies the first one is called the auth token which is the session id which is what you really want um, and the other one is uh, called twitter underscore says even though uh, it says says but it's not the actual session id it's just storing a bunch of uh, random values like uh, it's kind of like a uh, Utility. So one of one of the things that it stores is the CSRF token. So it it looks like uh, you could modify this uh, Twitter uh, Twitter underscore says with an attack unknown value. That means theoretically I could replace my Twitter underscore says uh, to to your browser. Then because uh, I know this CSRF token of this uh, session, then I can I could uh, use the accessors to pollute the cookie to twitter.com and force you to accept this cookie. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not that easy because the, uh, all these cookies were protected by HTTP only. And if a cookie has the HTTP only attribute, then it cannot be read or write uh, or written uh, from JavaScript API. That means it can only be done uh, when you have a legit, request, a legit response with the set cookie header. You cannot um, do anything with it. But there, there was a bug in Safari before version 12. Um, it allows you to overwrite a code case with the HTTP only flag. So I could um, th uh, actually uh, uh, use this uh, technique to, um, to attack vic uh, victims using Safari. But you could actually do more than that. You can abuse uh, one thing in the specification to legitimately overwrite an HTTP-only cookie. Um, it's, um, yeah, uh, I forgot to mention, this technique is called cookie tossing. So I could uh, use this technique to bypass this flag because I can uh, create a cookie with the same name but different key tuple. Like this is um, the, what you wanted to achieve. Like say this endpoint uh, tweet slash create can create a, a tweet and you f use the accessors to force uh, the victim's browser to accept uh, your uh, tweet sets, which contains the CSRF token, then you theoretically could do that so that, uh, because uh, Twitter is uh, receiving these uh, attackers' sets, 
And then the authenticity token is the CSRF token. And because the attacker already know this value, so he can theoretically uh, force his CSRF token to the victim and, the, and then to perform the CSRF attack. But in reality, it doesn't work because um, uh, if you actually try that, then you will find the, f the, the forced cookie is placed uh, after the original cookie, and the spec, and the spec tells you why. So um, it basically says that cookies that is created earlier is placed before the cookie is created after. So because in because the original cookie has to be created before your fake cookies. So your cookies will always be after the original cookie. And the specs don't really mention how to handle multiple cookies, just like uh, HTTP parameter pollution. And most servers only accept the first occurrence. That means the original cookie. And, and they ignore the, uh, the fake cookie that you injected. And also, like as I said, most browsers place cookies uh, created earlier first, as mentioned in the specification. But there is a hack. If you notice, the spec also tells you that cookies with longer paths are listed before cookies with shortest paths. So uh, what it's saying is that if you define the path to be more specific than the original one, that means, right, for example, uh, because this endpoint is uh, sitting under the I directory, and you uh, specify the path attribute of the fake cookie to be I, and then your cookie will then be placed be, uh, before the original cookie because your cookie has a more specific path attribute than the original one. Then you successfully uh, turn uh, subdomain XSS to a site-wide CSRF with this technique. And this is exactly what I did with Twitter. The other thing you can do is uh, to abuse the limitation of the cookie jar. Um, if you look at the spec, it tells you uh, it tells the browser to only uh, handle a certain amount of cookies because uh, if, if it doesn't ha have a limitation, then a website can set unlimited cookies to, to make a denial of service with your storage. So they have to set a certain threshold to their cookie jar. So the other way to override an HTTP-only cookie is to remove it. Uh, how to remove it? So there is a limitation. Um, it uh, the spec tells you like 50 cookies, but it's uh, it's not uh, actually 50 cookies. It depends on the implementation of each browser. But basically, if you say you have a 51 cookies, then what do you do? You start to remove the oldest cookie. So it's like um, first in, first out, right? So when there's no space, the oldest cookie will be, get deleted. So what you can do is you can set up a bunch of junk cookies. And then uh, the previous cookie will then be removed because there is no new, no space for the new cookie, and so you can use this technique to remove any HTTP only cookie. But there is a drawback because you have to count precisely how many cookies uh, the victim browser already has, and it's not easy because uh, uh, website usually has a lot of tracking cookies on like advertisement that kind of stuff, so it's not really easy. But um, is something to, to know, I guess. And there are more applications that you can do with cookie tossing. Um, uh, this is uh, an example that I did that turned a self XSS to full XSS. Uh, the self XSS basically means that you can only exploit uh, the XSS with your account because the, uh, uh, the payload is stored in your account uh, instead of the victim's account. So what I did was. Um, I forced my session cookies um, with the path uh, admin dot uh, admin slash oauth, it uh, so that it uh, takes higher precedence of the uh, of victim's uh, original session. Then I locked in with the um, oauth, so that means I am forcing uh, my my session to the victim, uh, and then it authorizes to an application in ShopifyCloud.com, and then. Uh, and then the, the victim will uh, will uh, will, be vul will will then have the JavaScript executed on this domain because uh, I, I already have an XSS there, but it's only supposed to be only um, accessible by me. And then because I only polluted 
uh, my domain, which is attacker.myshopify.com. And then I can still use the victim.myshopify.com to relog in the victim. And then at the same time, I uh, retain access, uh, I retain an iframe that is still executing the JavaScript code. And then after I relog in the victim, then uh, this domain will have the session of the, of, of the victim again. Then because uh, the XSS is still executing, then any other uh, actions that I do is on behalf of the victim. So uh, basically, uh, at this point, I'm only uh, attacking my account because uh, the, the, the victim is uh, using my session. But then I re-log in the victim with their original account, then I can uh, keep the XSS alive, and then only after they are re-logged in, then I can use the XSS to attack them again. So uh, it's very complicated, and, but um, you, can, you can take a look at my report on HackerOne, um, but I guess it's also very complex. But anyway, the other thing you can do is uh, session fixation. Uh, session fixation was, was supposed to be a dead problem because uh, in order to exploit a session fixation, you usually need to do some kind of injection, like, uh, page, like question mark PHP session ID that kind of stuff, but it's it's not uh, it's not a thing anymore. But some applications, uh, when you log into these applications, they will not set a new session code key. They are actually reusing the um, the older session code key, and this is a problem. Um, and and this is a problem on uh, Shopify. So this domain uh, is vulnerable to session fixation. So. Um, um, Wait, wait, sorry. Um, actually, uh, there are some other subdomains called uh, like flow.shopifycloud.com is vulnerable to, sub, uh, to session fixation. And you have an XSS in like script editor.shopify.com. And then you use the XSS to force a session code key that is uh, scoped to every subdomain of Shopify.cloud using the XSS. And then, and then you can use the OAuth to lock the victim to uh, these uh, to the flow application, and because they are locking in with my session, so uh, when after the the victim uh, has authorized this application, then I can lock in as him in this application because the application does not create a new session after the login. So this is also something you can do with um, with this, with the cookie tossing. Okay. Um, um, so basically, as I said, uh, this, uh, there are a lot of specifications of cookies. So at some point, you, you have to make some mistakes in implementing them because um, browsers and servers don't really know what to f what spec to follow. So there's sometimes some discrepancy. Um, if you notice, we can only set one cookie at a time in a single set cookie header, uh, and you you cannot set two cookies in one set cookie header, which is a little bit stupid because it's redundant. But actually, the older specs allow setting multiple code keys in one single set code key header. And this is a bug that, is not, uh, f that was not found by me, but uh, the other guy. Uh, so he basically had a code key base XSS. That means uh, the code key value is reflected in, into the page without any sanitization. But you have to have a code key injection uh, to export it first. Um, so. Uh, the older spec basically tells you you can add comma uh, to do to set multiple cookies in one set cookie header. Like uh, in this example, you have like through equals one to three, and then some attributes, and then you can add a comma, and then to set another attribute, and then the browser will happily set two cookies. Uh, but it only works in Safari before the version ten because uh, it was like the very old spec. So. It's no longer exploitable, but um, I'll tell you how to make it uh, exploitable in the very uh, next few slides. But let's get back to the um, the, the issues that, um, that that the guy found. So uh, the guy basically found in cross-site scripting the cookie base uh, cross-site scripting on uh, the outlook.live.com, and then he also found a limited. Uh, cookie injection, so he can control the value of the the realm um, 
uh, cookie, but he cannot set a new cookie. But what he can do is he can add uh, a comma and then an, a, a white space and then a new cookie. Then Safari will, will set two cookies for the browser. So um, as you can see, like well equals uh, the original value, like uh, hotmail.com, and then the, the injected cookies, the client ID, which is the vulnerable parameter, and then he can use this limited cookie injection um, to exploit the cookie-based cross-site scripting. Okay, so that one was not exploitable, but this one is a little bit uh, different because that one was client-side, but actually server-side is also ex uh, expecting comma-separated cookies because this specification also tells you for backward compatibility, uh, the, se the separator can not only be semicolon but also a comma. So that means um, even though the browser does not set two cookies for you, but if you send a, a cookie uh, which has uh, a comma in its value, then the, the, the server will actually think it's two cookies. And this is what uh, this, this guy did in Twitter. Um, this guy uh, is very, very good at exploiting these kind of issues. So basically, he exploited two bugs. The first bug is Google Analytics uh, will set a cookie. I think you all know what Google Analytics is. So when you are navigating to a site, uh, then the Google Analytics will set a refer, a co uh, refer a cookie um, like, this, like these formats. And then the, the, pro the first problem is Google Analytics does not encode some uh, disallowed value, like comma. If you check the spec, the comma is not a valid value for a cookie. It's disallowed. It's a special character. So it's fair, uh, the browser don't care about that. But anyway, uh, Google Analytics uh, does not encode uh, the, the comma. So if you are navigating from this uh, URL, like uh, some random.com, and then uh, this weird path, and then Google Analytics will set a cookie uh, in this format. And you can notice it's, uh, like it's, in, it's like injecting a cookie with only value, but you can do uh, any like comma. And then when this cookie is sent to Twitter, then the Twitter service will parse it, will parse it as two cookies. Uh, it's basically treating this comma as a, as a semicolon because the older spec tells you to uh, treat it as a semicolon. So because um, the, the older version of Koki, uh, of Twitter was using uh, this uh, weird parameter name as a Koki value. So you can uh, force this Koki value to the victim and then because you can control value then you can just like do an X and then you can perform CSRF to any endpoint on twitter.com. And I think this is still applicable to, uh, to, to uh, like these days. Uh, somebody asked me why I didn't do a research on how many uh, server uh, software are affected and because I was lazy. But, and then this morning I found out, uh, I, did, I did a little bit of research and uh, it's actually uh, more common than you think. So this is an interest, interesting case. So this is somebody created an issue on Jetty, and it was just last year. And it, it basically, uh, so Jetty did not treat a, a, a comma as a semicolon, but then this guy tell, uh, tells the developer that you should uh, treat a comma as a semicolon. So it's, it's actually suggesting the developer to add back the, the bug to Jetty, and it's actually in the code. Uh, it's on version 10, I think. Yep. So, so basically, it's more common than you think. A lot of servers are actually uh, accepting comma as the separator of cookies. So, if you have a cookie injection, then you can try to add a comma. Then you can add new cookies uh, for the server, and you can do a lot of crazy stuff like CSRF token, like this case, or even other stuff like session, just just like what I mentioned. Uh, defense. Um, cookie prefixes uh, is uh, proposed by Chrome and is uh, is a thing that you can use in all major browsers nowadays. Uh, what it does is that you can set uh, a cookie with the under two underscores, a host, and a, and a um, uh, what's this? Uh, slash something, uh, whatever, um, and then. 
uh, the uh, cookies with these prefixes cannot have uh, the domain attribute. So it prevents subdomains from forcing a cookie to current domain. So it basically for, uh, solves the issue of cookie tossing. So this is a quick example. If I have a cookie uh, with the host prefix, um, and then if I, if I want to add a domain attribute, then the, co the browser will refuse to set such a cookie because uh, the, uh, this cookie is not supposed to have the domain attribute. And because you cannot set a domain attribute, so it solves the issue of uh, the cookie tossing problem because then your sub your subdomain can no longer set cookies for its other subdomain or the main domain so this is something uh, you can do to prevent cookie tossing and i believe it's the only way you can do to prevent cookie tossing and not a lot of applications are using this so i think uh, it's something to consider and the other uh, defense is you have to follow only the, the latest specification, which is the, two, the 6265, uh, instead of the older ones, because there are a lot of discrepancies between these uh, specs. So you have to only follow one. If you support multiples, then you are basically screwed, because uh, these specifications are contradicting to each other. So if you supporting like the older one and the newer one, then you will have a lot of discrepancy, and it's disc the discrepancy is the root cause of everything, basically. And this is a uh, public service announcement. Um, in next year, CSRF will be killed as a category because Chrome is trying to force the same side attribute to, uh, to every cookie. Uh, the same side attribute basically tells you if you are requesting an access, an access uh, in a third party domain, then the cookies will not be sent. Um, which is basically the ultimate solution to CSRF. So if you want to exploit CSRF, you have to take your time because it's only uh, a couple of months uh, before they implemented this on Chrome. And not only CSRF, but also other issues like uh, XSSI, uh, cross, cross uh, whatever, I forgot that's the full name. Um, so because there are a lot of other stuff that uh, attacks that rely on the cookies being sent in the request in a cross origin context. So. Um, it's very sad news, but take your time, yeah, right. And that's all. Um, thank you very much. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, oh, yo, 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 yo. Okay, so, because of time, we're going to open up a Q&A question. 那呃，因为 file descriptor 听得懂中文，所以可以用中文来问他问题。啊、不不,不一定啊。啊，你都讲不一定了。不不不,不好。<笑>好，那现场有什么问题吗？有的麻烦可以举手让我看到。哎、欸，好，这边有一个。好，我来问好了。嗯、um, ，OK， English， OK。哦，也 Yes， please， please、okay.。等下广东话来着。呃、uh, ， English， because of... <笑> OK， so um。Uh, I thank you for the sharing. It's a very in-depth and also very detailed okay, for everyone who would like to know more about in, the, uh, in this area. But uh, you know, uh, in this in this room, there is not only the security professional in the room, on the room, but also there are students in the room. As a student's point of view, uh, in what aspect or, or what approach that you would like to suggest them to start from this area or studying more in details? Can you, yeah? Give us some suggestions. Uh, I think, uh, the, uh, like the first thing you can do is to actually read the specifications, uh, not only the, the latest one but also the oldest ones, because, like, um, actually a lot of issues that I found was related to the some hidden sentences in the specification because. The uh, like the developers usually ignore these like suggestions or the defense that is uh, mentioned in the spec. So if you actually spend the time to read the spec, you'll find a lot of discrepancies, a lot of stuff that developers forget, and you can you you can us usually exploit these facts because um, because uh, developers are lazy. Uh, I'm, I'm lazy, but at least I'm not as lazy as them. So. Uh, you can first try to read the specs, and then not only you can really understand in depth how cookies work, but you will also spot something that nobody has ever noticed before. Yep. 好，谢谢。那就再来我们掌声谢谢 Feral Descriptor。